Welcome everybody to the second of our four part series, um, webinar series for students in Alberta. Uh, today's webinar is entitled Climate Change, Impacts and Game Changers. Before we get started, um, it is tradition in the Blackfoot culture to greet each other by saying who you are and where you have come from and who you're related to. So, um, I will begin with my personal land acknowledgement. And as I do so, just kind of think about your own land acknowledgement. So my name is Jennifer Jensen. I'm executive director of the Alberta Tomorrow Foundation. I was born Jennifer Yedlowski in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, also known as Nisakwatunina in the Cree language. Saskatoon is in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional, traditional lands of the Cree, the Soto, the Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nation. My family consisted of my mom and my dad, Diane and Ed, and my brother, Dean. I grew up visiting our family farm, camping across the province, picking Saskatoon berries, blueberries, and wild mushrooms. From these experiences, I developed a close tie to the land, which led me to pursue a career in environmental studies and land use. Today, I live in Cochrane, Alberta, with my husband, Drew, and two teenage girls, Jade and Brooke. And my extended family here consists of my husband's parents, sister and family, and his cousins and family. I acknowledge that I live, educate, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Lehari, Nakoda Nations, the Bearspaw, Wesley, and Shiniki, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Sikani, Skainai, the Satina, part of the Dene people, the uh, Tunaha, Shewemsen, Mountain Cree and Métis Region 3 in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. Please take a moment to do your own personal land acknowledgement. Once again, welcome to our webinar series on climate change. We initially had earth, air, fire and water as our four webinars. And so this is the second one where we're talking about air, but focusing on climate change. I would like to briefly introduce our three panelists today. Um, some housekeeping things before we do that. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer feature in the in Zoom. Um, and we will be answering questions after each of the three panelists have have done their short presentation and as well at the end. So our first panelist is going to be Jason Wang. He is an analyst working on Pembina um, Institute's electricity program, including Canada's net zero electricity, grid goal and electrical vehicle infrastructure. He has an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Alberta and a master of science in engineering and policy analysis from TU Delft in the Netherlands. He has previously worked with Government of Alberta on climate policy analysis, industrial carbon pricing regulations, and adaptation risk management. He's an Edmonton local. He spent time in Germany, the Netherlands, the UK, working on energy systems modeling. And he previously led the University of Alberta's EcoCar team, which builds and races ultra efficient hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and worked in Nunavut on improving youth and health um, and youth health and digital skills. Exciting. I wanna ask you about some of those things later. Um, our second panelist is going to be Jacqueline from uh, CPAW's Southern Alberta chapter. Jacqueline is an environmental educator for CPAW's. She has a bachelor of science in biology with a business minor from the University of Alberta and a master of education from the University of Calgary. Her interdisciplinary master on education of education includes studies in education for the environment um, and approaches to wellness. Jacqueline is passionate about social and environmental justice and is working with the CPAWS team to break down systemic barriers to outdoor recreation and environmentalism. And our last speaker will be Melanie uh, Hoffman. Melanie is program manager uh, for the Capital Regional Eco Schools with ACE, Alberta Council for Environmental Education in Edmonton. 
She uh, is a PhD chemist and passionate educator with over a decade of experience. And Melanie has directed curriculum integrated community climate action projects with King Center for Visualization in Science. We have a wealth of knowledge and education here with us today. Um, and the way the webinar is gonna work is each one of our panelists is gonna give us a, a quick, probably eight minute presentation. There's gonna be time for some questions after each presentation. And then once again, we will have questions at the end. But to get us started, uh, we are gonna use a tool called Menti. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jacqueline and she's gonna get us started with some opening kind of uh, Menti questions. Perfect. Thanks, Jennifer. So if everyone wants to come and join me over at menti.com, so you can do that on a phone, a tablet, the computer that you're watching this from, whatever is going to be easiest. Um, teachers in the classroom, you can just set it up on one device and answer for your class. You can have, you know, raise of hands to get um, information to put into our Menti questions. So you can go to menti.com and enter this code 85603001 and we'll do a few warm up questions and then we'll use it in between each presenter as we go. So our first warm up question is to find out who's in our virtual room with us. Um, so you can tag any of the different grades that might be with you or if we have any post-secondary or other youth groups or adults that have joined us, um, please go ahead and put that in the Mentimeter. Anytime we're on Mentimeter, you can see at the top where to go in case you accidentally lose it and we're sharing the screen, menti.com, and the code will always be there up at the top. It's also in the chat and we can always repaste the link and the code in the chat if anyone loses it. So it looks like in the room today, we have a whole bunch of grade fours, which is super exciting. And some grade fives have joined us as well. So thank you to everyone who has joined us. And let's check out our second warm up question. We would like to hear what is your favorite part of summer? The weather's getting really nice in Alberta so already. And um, we want to hear, you know, what you're excited for in this season. So again, teachers, you can put in as many answers as you'd like, or really as we have time for, because we'll have to move pretty quickly. But feel free to, you know, get some raise of hands in your classroom and add in some answers. So far, we've got some horseback riders, swimmers, campers, playing soccer, picking flowers, enjoying the sun. I just love having the sun as well. Somebody's got a summer birthday, which is exciting. So that's coming up. Playing outside, being at the beach, going to the pool, tubing, lots of swimmers and campers. So you can see in these word clouds, the more times a word is submitted, the larger that that word will get. So we've got, you know, lots of folks that like camping and swimming. And really everything I see here is fun things to do outside and connect to nature. So I'm really excited to see that. So we've got one more um, warm up question before we get on to our first speaker. So what's your favorite outdoor activity? We saw quite a few of these in our first summer question. People that like swimming and soccer and gardening, but maybe you have a favorite outdoor activity from a different season doesn't have to be summer. <laughs> We've got some kayaking, some hiking. So we've got a skier and some hockey. So we've got some winter outdoor activities as well. Skidoo. Are there no bikers out there? I haven't seen biking yet. Mountain biking. <laughs> Take it, Jennifer is a biker. <laughs> so we'll take about 30 more seconds for any last answers to get here on Menti. And then I will stop sharing my screen so Jason can share his and kick us off with the panelists. So thank you everyone for sharing here. I love to see, oh, we've got biking now by request of Jennifer. Um, hiking, swimming, fishing, some of the biggest ones there. 
Um, don't close out of Menti. You can just minimize it and we'll pop back into it later. So I'm going to stop sharing and kick it right over to Jason. Excellent. So when Jason, while Jason is sharing his screen, I'll just reiterate the title of our webinar today, Climate Change, Impacts, and Game Changers. So Jason is going to tell us a little bit about the climate change science. Yeah, thank you um, for the great introductions. Sorry, I uh, I need I'm having a slight technical issue again. Um, one window is not popping up. Just give me one second, and I'll get that sorted. See, it always works when we test it, and then <laughs> <laughs> under pressure. Yeah, it. I'm. Uh, this is so strange. It was. Just there. <laughs> um, okay. Is it sharing a window versus sharing a um, screen, perhaps, it's not or something? It's, it's 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 not sharing my notes to me. Um, so I can definitely present without them, but I prefer to have them. <laughs> um, okay. If I can't find it in 15 seconds, we'll move on. Okay. Uh, perfect, there it is. All right. All right. Thanks everyone for waiting. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jennifer and Jacqueline for the introductions. My name's Jason Wong. Um, and like, uh, like they said, I'm an analyst with the Pembina Institute, and we're a clean energy think tank um, with offices all across Canada. And basically what that means is uh, we do some research and we do a lot of communications uh, with you know, the public, with governments, with industry about what getting to um, a clean energy future might look like. Um, so yeah, I have a background in engineering and policy and also in climate and economic modeling. I was born in China near the uh, capital Beijing, and I'm coming in today from uh, Treaty 6 territory in what is now known as Edmonton. And I'll be talking a little bit about what's happening on Earth with our climate and why. So firstly, I want to introduce you to the idea of global heating. And I'm curious um, if you write in the chat if you've heard of this before, but basically what global heating is, is just something we've observed. The planet has been getting warmer and warmer and warmer over the last uh, 100 years or so. So um, I'm going to be showing a couple, a couple of charts today, and I'll try to uh, walk you through what all of those are really saying. But in this chart, what I really want to highlight um, to you is just Temperatures have been going up. The line in the diagram shows temperature. And you can see from around 1850, which was quite a long time ago, um, temperature has gone up uh, over one degree Celsius already. And this is the average temperature on the surface of Earth. Um, but if we look even further back, uh, what, is that, what does that mean? What does 1.5 uh, or 1 to 1 1.5 degrees mean? Um, the last time temperatures were around that high, except for a little spike around like uh, 100,000 years ago, the last time they were really that high was around like maybe like three to 10 million years ago. Um, and, and before that, maybe like 100 million years ago. Uh, especially if we're looking at degree uh, temperature change of like around four degrees Celsius, um, we're really looking back millions of years. And often when people talk about um, temperature, they, they talk about numbers, but they don't really talk about what that actually means. So I just wanna highlight that um, about a hundred million years ago, wind temperatures were around like that three to four degree range compared to um, what this chart is showing about uh, the average around the 1960s, 1990s, maybe when your parents were uh, kids, um, temperatures, when they were that high, uh, Alberta was underwater. <laughs> there was very little ice in the world, uh, like the Arctic, the Antarctica, 
the, there wasn't a lot of ice and sea levels were way higher. And as a result, um, ha yeah, half of North America was underwater. So because temperatures are rising again, it's actually leading to a lot of things again, like ice melting, uh, sea levels rising, but um, I'm not gonna talk as much about impacts. I'll leave that to another presenter. Uh, I do wanna highlight that even though when we were talking about these average temperature changes and how big their impacts might be, average is, um, we're talking about the whole planet, right? And the actual changes in different parts of the planet are different. So for example, at 1.5 degrees, you can see in that left map of the planet, um, which is where we're closest to right now, we're around 1.2 to 1.4 degrees above um, uh, what we say is pre-industrial temperatures. You can see like the north of Canada and the Arctic is actually uh, quite a bit warmer. We're warming more than two times faster than the rest of the world. So uh, that means Canada is having a different impact than other places. Anyways, what's causing this heating? So the main cause of it is what's called the greenhouse effect. And I'm curious if you've ever been inside a greenhouse or maybe just sitting inside a, a car on a hot day. Basically what happens in the greenhouse effect is heat comes in through something like a window or the atmosphere and it gets trapped inside. Not all of it, but enough that over time um, that heat stays and uh, the, the planet or your car gets warmer and warmer and warmer. Um, we know that uh, you know glass creates this greenhouse effect, but also certain gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, CO2, CH4. And we know because we've tested these um, like in the laboratory or just from our understanding of chemistry, but we also know on a global scale, there's a huge correlation between temperature and uh, carbon dioxide con concentration and the other greenhouse gases as well. But this is just a, a chart showing that correlation back to um, 800,000 years ago. So a very long time ago when none of us definitely were alive. Correlation um, does not uh, always mean, or it's not, it's not complete proof. Um, there are many other ways that we've uh, determined that this is, this is happening for these reasons and also um, where it's, it's coming from. So this is just a little chart um, I'll show where some scientists have tried to understand what are the different causes. And I'll just highlight in that second panel, they've said uh, total human influence is like around at least a, 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 uh, one degree Celsius. Most of that's come from greenhouse gases that we've emitted. Um, we've actually emitted things that, that have cooled the planet too, but overall we've uh, contributed more to warming than to cooling. The so warming is in the red, cooling is in the blue. So scientists actually last year wrote a report um, that said it is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the planet. Um, and the term unequivocal means there's absolute certainty. There's no doubt at all anymore that climate change is being caused by humans. It used to be like 99% sure, but now we are 100% sure. So um, I'm gonna go through the rest of these uh, quite quickly. Um, if I think you're interested, you can definitely come back and look at them, but uh, how do we know that climate change is caused by humans? Like how are we certain um, about this, this red bar basically? The first one is we can do very simple math and just understand green, greenhouse gases mostly come from fossil fuels and the fossil fuels that we've been burning across the planet has been increasing tremendously over the last uh, 100 years or so. The second thing is uh, there are many types and sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A lot of it uh, is, is very natural, like we breathe out carbon dioxide but we can actually distinguish between carbon dioxide that comes from fossil fuels and carbon dioxide that you and I might breathe out. And this is just a chart basically showing that the amount of um, carbon dioxide from like human breathing or other sort of natural short-term sources have gone down. Um, 
relative to the amount of uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. Um, we also know that uh, forests that have traditionally captured a lot of carbon dioxide from the air actually aren't capturing them anymore, or overall they're not. Overall, they're actually emitting more carbon dioxide than they used to be. Um, unfortunately, some of these changes uh, that have already happened, we can't do anything about. And our actions today, um, we have to think about it in a way of preventing um, further harm. It'll take uh, quite a long time and a lot of effort to, to reach these targets. Um, this is basically just chart showing the trends of carbon dioxide, uh, or sorry, of temperature in the air caused by different carbon dioxide, um, what we call pathways, different ways the world might unfold. And you can see in these like very low CO2 emission scenarios, um, our overall temperature change is still sort of similar to where we are at today. But if it gets higher, um, impacts will be uh, also higher and worse. Um, I'll just quickly try to wrap up on where uh, emissions are coming from. So, Jason, and, you've got uh, like maybe, one minute. Yeah, <laughs> maybe think a little bit about uh, what we might be able to do about it. So um, this is a chart showing just where emissions in Canada have been coming from. And I'll just highlight uh, transportation, building electricity, and oil and gas. These are the main places they're coming from. Um, I'd say also maybe uh, less intuitively, a lot of the emissions that are in each of these sectors are from heating. So if we can figure out a way to you know, heat things or cool things for um, with less energy, um, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, be able to do a lot in tackling our emissions issues. Um, just to finish off on things that you, uh, even as grade four students can think about, um, talk about this with your parents, talk about it with your friends. Uh, climate policy makes a really big impact. Um, and once you're 18, uh, go out and vote. <laughs> but also other things that you can talk to your parents about, um, flying less has a huge impact, uh, eating less meat, especially red meat. These are things you can do, bringing down the heat in your house, using renewable energy. These are all things that um, are maybe choices that you and your parents can implement. But we do also need very large systemic change that uh, we'll have to cooperate on as a society, as countries, as governments. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jason. I love some of your graphs and how it shows the scale. Graphs are tricky, right? If you don't look at long term or if you just look at a tiny portion, you don't get the overall effect. But that one that goes down back millions of years. Wow. Very interesting. Jacqueline, did we have any questions immediately? No immediate questions. So if you have questions for Jason, feel free to throw them in the Q&A and we will have time for Q&A for all three panelists at the end as well. Um, and Jason, if you wanna stop sharing your screen, I will pull up Mentimeter again. So if mm -hmm. some folks I see um, have already gone there, which is great. Um, so feel free to head back to Mentimeter. And in between each panelist, we'd like to hear a little bit about what you learned um, from each person, maybe how that person inspired you. So thank you to everyone who's shared so far. And I'm gonna pull that up. So we can see that Jason is a very smart guy. Um, and that's what was really appreciative by some of the folks that are sharing so far. And I'm going to pop my screen onto my part of the presentation uh, while folks finish uh, sharing up some thoughts about what they've learned from Jason. Just gonna pop up that. I'm sure Jason could have spoken about um, the science of climate change for another few hours. <laughs> and we gave him about eight minutes. So um, there is plenty more information to, uh, to explore there. Um, our second panelist is Jacqueline. And as the title of our webinar, she's going to talk about the impacts of climate change here in Alberta. So I'll pass it back to Jacqueline. 
Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Jason. Um, so to continue learning about climate change impacts to species and spaces in Alberta, I want to introduce you to Petey the Pika. So we're going to kind of take a look at what is happening based on those things that Jason has been sharing with us. What is that actually doing to our, our ecosystems and to our species? So pikas are very close relative of rabbits. They like to live in rocky outcroppings or slopes in mountainous areas, such as the one in this picture. They like a cool and dry climate. They are herbivores, which means they eat plants. And now, even though they're so tiny, they actually eat a whole lot. Well, pikas don't hibernate through winter. So instead, they collect plants in the fall and they dry them out under rock piles. They can gather up to 28 kilograms of food for the winter. So this would be like you making 5,000 shopping trips each fall to prepare for the winter. It's a lot of work. So the Pika's normal range extends from Western Canada to the Northern mountainous regions of the United States. And they're very sensitive to changes in temperature. So let's take a look at what happens to Pika's when they're exposed to different climate conditions. So we've got some more graphs showing some of the different temperatures that we might see the temperature change above pre-industrial level, like Jason was teaching us about. So we can see our current um, map, and this is the data that we had available. This is the United States, um, but kind of similar things are happening just above here in Canada. So the red is current Pika habitat. And then as we get hotter and hotter, depending how hot we get to, you'll see that um, pikas lose a lot of their habitat. So if, Earth, if the Earth got hotter by five degrees Celsius, they would lose most of their habitat. So to learn a little bit more about pikas and what's happening to them based on climate change, we're going to play a little game in the chat. So get the chat box ready. And this game is called Fake News. So we'll have three different questions. And in each question, there is going to be three answers that are correct and one answer that is fake news. So you have to figure out which one you think is fake news. So over the years, we've learned more about pika by studying them. We've learned that pikas like to live in a cold climate and have special characteristics to help them stay warm during the winter. So which of these four answers is not a reason that helps Pika stay warm during winter time? I will read them all out, but if you feel like you know the answer, you can type either A, B, C, or D in the chat. Remember, you're giving us the one that is fake news. So Pika's can stay warm during the winter thanks to A, snow making a nice blanket for them to stay warm in cold temperatures, or B, they already have lots of fur to keep them warm in cold temperatures, or C, melting waters from the glaciers gives them cold water, or D, they dig underground burrows to protect them from the cold. So I can see that we've got Nicole playing with us in the chat. Thank you. And in fact, Nicole is correct, and as is Dalcy. So melting waters from the glaciers giving them cold waters is indeed fake news. This is actually a negative impact of uh, climate change that we are losing our glaciers. So let's play one more right away. As suitable habitat for the pikas shrinks, pikas will have less space to forage for food. And we're starting to see more competition between the different populations for the same food. So in this round of fake news, you need to tell us which is a plant that pikas don't eat. So the pika likes to eat A, Ross Avens, B, wild rose, C, pine grass, or D, moss campion. Three of these are pika food, and one of them is fake news. We've got a couple of guesses happening in the chat, and Dulce's group is correct. It is the wild rose. Wild rose is not found in the alpine, subalpine zones where we find the pikas. It's not a good growing condition for wild rose, so the pikas don't encounter them. B, 
Before we get to our last round of fake news, we're going to learn a little bit more about how climate change is impacting the basic needs of the pika, how it's accessing, how it's impacting their access to food, water, shelter, and space. So for food, oops, I'm too fast here, food. As pikas have less space, as I mentioned before, they are getting swished into the same area, meaning that they have to compete for the same resources and they are all after the same grasses and shrubs. Water. What do you think happens to water as it gets hotter? It evaporates. So now think of where water is located here in Alberta, in lakes, rivers, wetlands, glaciers, these are massive bodies of water or ice. So they can't evaporate very easily, right? Well, we're actually seeing signs of this already happening because it's getting hotter and drier in Alberta. We're seeing less wetlands, decreased water capacity of our river, rivers and shrink, shrinking glaciers, making it harder for animals to access safe water. For space, we talked a little bit how climate change is affecting pika space. They're normally found just above the tree line on the mountains where the rocky slopes start forming. But as our climate is getting hotter and hotter, we're starting to sh see shifts in habitat. Pikas are getting more and more crowded and they have to keep moving higher up the mountains. Oops. And as they do this, sorry, my graphics are a little slow. As they do this, um, they eventually won't have anywhere to go. And this is something that we call vertical extinction when they've lost their habitat at the top of the mountain. So finally, habitat for their shelter. Having less snow um, because of climate change is troublesome for the pika because they do normally hide out under the deep snow pack and that gives them a very good shelter to stay warm. So this brings us to our last round of fake news. So climate change negatively impacts Alberta ecosystems. Here we have three negative impacts and one that is fake news. So are the negative impacts, and again, please play along in the chat. Are they A, longer winters, B, shrinking boreal habitat turning into grasslands, C, spreading of dangerous insects carrying diseases, or D, increased risk of fire. So three of these are negative climate change impacts. One of them is fake news. We've got a few different guesses coming through. And yes, very good, everyone. It is longer winters. Of course, we are not seeing that. We're seeing shorter winters. But all of the others are indeed negative impacts of climate change including our shrinking boreal habitat turning into grasslands. And so if we take a look overall at what's happening to our Alberta ecosystems, on the left, we have a basic map of Alberta's ecosystems where we have our large boreal forest and scientists are predicting that through climate change, we will continue to lose that boreal forest to drought and forest fire and other reasons and will become more of a grasslands province here in Alberta. So how can we help vulnerable species like the pika? Well, we're going to turn it over to Melanie to hear lots of ways that we can contribute. But just before we pop over to her, remember to pop back into Mentimeter. And we can hear a little bit about some things you learned from my presentation. I'd love to hear uh, what you learned. And then we'll pass it back over to Melanie. Thanks, Jacqueline. Wow, it's hard to believe that that's one little species and the impacts that it'll have on climate change will have on one little species and think about how many other species there are. Very interesting. And I also find it kind of mind blowing to think that the ecosystems as we know them in Alberta right now are going to change in the future under or could change <laughs> under climate change, depending on how severe it is. Losing, losing forests, losing the parkland. So. so we don't currently have any questions yet, but remember okay. if you want to pop questions either in the chat or Q&A 
We're all happy to answer them. And we'll definitely have time at the end mm -hmm. as well to hear from any of the four of us, really, any questions that you have. Great. Well, let's hear from Melanie. Melanie's going to talk to us about game changers. We've learned about the science. We've seen how climate change can impact one species in Alberta. And most importantly, we need to figure out what can we do to change this. So Melanie, off to you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Jen for hosting and Jason for setting the stage so beautifully. Um, I'm just gonna try and find all my views again <laughs> so that I can feel like I can see things because right now I can't see anybody. This is always the weirdest. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go with, I can't see anybody, but you can see me. Um, and you can see these wonderful five young women um, who are globally known as climate game changers. Vanessa Nakate, Luisa Neubauer, Greta Thunberg, Isabel Axelsson, Lukina Tille, uh, pictured here in Davos in 2020. So maybe that's someone you think of when you think of climate game changers. Let me introduce you to a few other ideas around being a climate game changer. First off, of course, um, CPAS actually has a beautiful resource called Climate Game Changers, which you can find at game, climategamechangers.ca. And I see, yes, I have found the chat. <laughs> Let's see. Awesome. And so this is an online toolkit you can explore to learn more. So you're getting lots of great resources um, here today that you can have a lot of fun with as you are doing in our session today. A group that you may already be familiar with, um, and if you're not, you should definitely look them up, are last week's um, Alberta Emerald Award winners in the youth category, uh, the Alberta Youth Leaders for Environmental Education. This is a group that is open to anyone um, in grades seven through 12 interested in taking action um, in their school community, in their other communities, in the environmental education space um, in the province. So there's different levels of engagement that you can get into here. And you can tell these folks just had an amazing time on the weekend celebrating their award and coming together to make plans for their next year of working together. So it's a great time to get involved. And you've already heard a little bit about me. So my name is uh, Melanie Hoffman and I am a mom, a science nerd, a nature lover from Germany originally, and now in Amis Pochiwa Skahigan, or what we now know as Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. And as a climate game changer, I think that the most important point for us to come back to is to remember that what we're doing is we're taking care of life. We are looking to work toward regeneration. And so that means taking care of ourselves and others. And some of the ways in which I do that is um, currently being able to work as program manager for Capital Region Eco Schools with ACE. So I get to connect students, schools in the um, Edmonton region with their municipality and their community to take action. So um, take a look at the Municipal Climate Change Action Center, MCCAC, to learn about what is going on in your own municipal municipality. I also have the honor of serving as lead mentor for climate reality leaders in the province. And so you too, um, can take a look at the offers of the Climate Reality Project, which include free trainings and include the opportunity for free to invite a trained climate reality leader to come and speak in your class um, or at any other um, event that you may be interested in bringing some climate reality, climate solutions to. 
You can also follow Drawdown Alberta, a movement um, that I had the pleasure of co-founding with the Alberta Environmental Network, um, which works at um, bringing together and visualizing, um, bringing forward the voices of climate game changers in our province. Lots of people in Alberta, you included, are doing great work to um, work toward regeneration and uh, this group and movement is looking to really um, raise the profile of that and so know that there are folks working on a just transition in Alberta and there are ways for you to get engaged. And um, coming from a science background, I really had to learn a lot about um, how we learn, uh, humans in general, not science nerds like me, and how do we engage in effective, curious conversations around difficult topics, um, which climate can often be. And so I'd uh, encourage you to take a look at um, and possibly try out this um, student adult climate conversation template that I had the pleasure of supervising a student in developing. <laughs> <laughs> Jason says too many charts. Been there, done that. And I love charts. They're so important, right? Um, and so um, in this conversation template, you'll find some prompts to help you um, have an open conversation with adults in your life that you'd like to chat with. And so you can find that at yegccs.kcbs.ca. Um, and then Lastly, uh, through that work, I got introduced to the idea of the carbon handprint. So what is it that you and I are doing that we are actively participating in to do good, to live in a good way, to uh, bring forward regeneration, to leave the place that we are honored to be in better than we've found it? And how are we taking care of ourselves? And so a resource that I'd like to give a shout out to in that context. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. My full screen went away. Oh, because I clicked on a link. <laughs> Is um, all the feelings under the sun. Let me bring back my full screen here. Um, oh, Delis, the uh, link for the student adult climate conversation template is on the YEGCCS website. Um, so if you go there, you should find that link. And please ask again if you um, have trouble locating that while I just reload my presentation here. And I think we're going to send out a follow-up email that will have all of these links included. So don't worry about trying to madly copy them down. You will get them. Thank you so much for bringing that in. And how much time do I have left? Because I'm probably... We have a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So here, I was going to just um, bring up this book, uh, All the Feelings Under the Sun, which is written for uh, youth to be able to um, learn ways in which we can be with the difficult feelings that we will experience um, when we're going through change. I mean, that's really just something that is um, darn it, that constant in life. Um, we're always um, looking for control and for uh, situations that are familiar, at least I do. And, uh, and this is a wonderful resource written for uh, kids for us to be able to practice techniques for how to be well with difficult, um, through, through difficult times. And this is also a really exciting time. And so what I want to introduce you to do is this, uh, a, a little segment of this clip with Shia Bastida, another youth advocate. Um, who invites us to imagine, because isn't that what we want to be doing? What do we want our communities to look like as we move through this decade um, that is going to be so foundational to our lives? Um, so let's take a look at what she has to share. So are, so are you ready to imagine? In this critical decade, the biggest tree planting campaign in history is sucking billions of tons of carbon out of the air. And forests and indigenous lands, they're protected. This is what your city looks like. It's green, I mean everywhere. Streets are pedestrian and kid friendly. Food growing on rooftops, in car parks, which by the way, we don't need anymore because we don't own cars anymore. 
And here's something. Birds. Can you imagine your city as a sanctuary for nature and wildlife? And so that's just a tiny little clip to get your appetites whetted and um, introduce you to this idea of regeneration and imagining the world that can be. The 2040 film explores that in more detail. And so the final resource um, that I want to leave you with is EcoSchools Canada, which is a framework that we at the Alberta Council for Environmental Education support as the on the ground partner in the province, along with the city of Calgary and the city of Edmonton, um, who are really excited partners, recognizing that schools play such an an important role in engaging our community at large in climate action. And so this framework is free for all publicly funded schools and it helps you build environmental leadership and capacity, mitigate climate change by improving operational efficiency of your buildings and recognize achievements and excellence through this collective impact framework. Uh, it also connects to the sustainable development goal, goals and is the largest environmental certification program for K-12 schools in Canada. So um, check this out and we'll share access to more information um, as well as some upcoming events. Here are some photographs of things that you might also be engaging in, such as indoor gardening, outdoor gardening, textile recycling, um, active transportation. Those are just some of the actions out of the 50 um, that that you can be inspired by on this framework, on this platform that provides you with um, guides. And then we provide you with local resources, connections to organizations such as Alberto Tomorrow and CPAWS um, for the local learning that they offer. If you'd like to know more about this, uh, join us on June 20th for the celebration of Capital Region Eco Schools. We'll be highlighting some of the great work there. And you might also be very interested teachers um, to join us for the Summer Institute for Climate Change Education, which will be all around climate justice, um, climate solutions, and how to bring those to life in your classroom with your students. And so I invite you um, to explore joining the Eco Schools movement and um, our Alberta Youth Leaders for Environmental Education are um, our, our youth leaders in that space also. So. Um, I hope you have found some things here that you're excited for. And I look forward to a little conversation. Thanks, Melanie. I, I'm amazed at all the good things that are actually happening. Um, sometimes we can get wrapped up in our kind of eco grief and feel a little bit hopeless. And everybody's in a different spot in their, their learning journey about climate change. Some people are still learning the science and some people are learning about the impacts but there are others who are okay what are we going to do about this and they um you've shown us a lot of tools a lot of things to think about things that we can we can do to to change the future um and as i said before we will get all of those links sent out to all participants after the after the webinar Um, Jason, I'm curious, um, how do you imagine the future after seeing that little video clip? You've done so much work on hydrogen fuel cells and, and emissions-free cars and things like that. Yeah, I'm actually also part of an organization in Edmonton called Paths for People, and we advocate for active transportation, pedestrianizing streets. Um, Luckily, Edmonton's already uh, made a commitment to reduce the number of uh, trips that people make by car. And we want to shift that more towards like biking or rolling in some other way um, or public transit. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about that and uh, how wonderful it'll be to have, you know, less noisy roads and um, just cleaner air too to breathe in cities. Really looking forward to that. And yeah, like seeing, you know, birds or other animals in, in, uh, in cities again. Um, sometimes I, uh, where my parents live, um, I've seen like deer in the city and I think it'd be wonderful if uh, that were, you know, even more normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also just super excited about uh, using clean energy too. Like uh, in the future, a lot of us will have solar panels on our roofs 
um, we'll be able to generate the energy that we need uh, ourselves without, you know, um, uh, relying on anyone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things that we can do, uh, and they're becoming more and more accessible, I guess. You know, sometimes you hear about an idea and you're like, yeah, how could I possibly do that, though? But um, that's what people said about solar panels 20 years ago. And here now we have homes on my street all over that have solar panels and solar farms. And so as as we move forward, things are just going to get easier for us to implement. For sure. So um, Melanie, you also gave us uh, a lot of links that we can go to. And uh, the Eco Schools um, is a great program for schools to kind of work towards their environmental goals and get certified. I love it. Do you know how many schools in Edmonton are already involved and how many schools in Calgary? Yeah, thanks for asking. So we had um, um, just over 70 schools in Alberta participate in um, wow. Eco Schools this year. Um, so it's been really awesome also to see uh, folks pick up the framework and we've had of course a few of those um, schools that are really plugged into environmental action who have um, brought the eco schools pro program to their school independently of ACEs support so I'm thinking of uh, Lacombe Composite High School for example who is uh, certifying as a platinum eco school for the second year in a row um, just on on their own and so we know that there's way more than those 70 schools um, across the province who are doing great work, who uh, deserve to learn about the framework and, and be celebrated through it. Um, and so, yeah, we just had the Mayor's Environment Expo in Calgary celebrate the certified and participant schools. Um, I think we had around 20 there and we have around, around 20 um, here in Edmonton that'll be celebrated on June 20th. Mm, great, great. And I, I love your video about imagining the future. And I think that's something we all need to really think about is what do we want that future to be? And then we need to decide how to get there. And I talk about this all the time when I use the Alberta Tomorrow Simulator with students because it's, it's a simulation tool that allows you to try things. You can try and you can take away a bunch of forests and see what the impact would be. You can add a bunch of forests and see what the impact would be. And so it, it lets you experiment, basically. <laughs> so we're not experimenting with real life. We're um, experimenting on the simulator and trying to figure out what it is we need to do to get where we want to be in the future. Yeah, that is such a beautiful and powerful tool in order to be able to explore these ideas. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, do we have any questions in the um, question and answer? No questions in that. No, we don't. So, I mean, we still have a few minutes. If any questions do come to mind, feel free to throw them either in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and I've been taking us along through a bit of a survey while we were sharing. So I appreciate everyone that's been answering those questions in the survey, kind of following up at the end with, we'd like to hear what you're going to take forward from our session today of how are you going to become a climate game changer um, and then we'll introduce you to uh, the next set of uh, webinars that are coming up in the fall so Jennifer did you want to talk any more about um, our fire and water sessions that are coming next year Sure, yeah, we, um, as I mentioned before, this is our four part series, we've already done earth and today is air. So in the fall, we will have fire and water, um, most likely talking about forest fires, uh, which links back once again to climate change. And um, the last one will be on water. And this also links back to climate change and we're not sure exactly what we'll talk about in that one but it could be related to fish it could be water quality it could be glaciers um that one will probably be closer to december and the fire one will be sometime the end of september beginning of october when everybody gets back into their new school year so stay tuned for those um you know follow us on social media so that you uh, can become aware of when those are and the, the links to register. Um, and 
CPAWS and Alberta Tomorrow um, have plenty of other educational opportunities for you to look at. So we've just got uh, the links here to Alberta Tomorrow and the CPAWS Southern Alberta Education Programs. And feel free to check those out. Uh, if you're a teacher planning for next year already, now is the time to, to figure that out. Um, and of course, we will send out that email that has the links to ACE and EcoSchools and all of those other links that, that Melanie mentioned. Do we have any last minute questions? And I think any, the other, oh. I was just gonna say in last minute, you know, comments from Jason or Melanie before we wrap up as well. Yeah, I kind of wanted to, to add one, which is just, um, I think, yeah, we, we've we shared a lot of resources, I think a lot of information, but I think um, just personally, if there were one thing I would want you folks to take away is that kids have enormous power in this world to create change. Um, I think, you know, that's sort of what the questions we're asking about, but I just want to give two quick examples. A lot of the international climate policy that governments are talking about um, they've changed how they're thinking about it because kids uh, like activists that Melanie showed are talking about it and kids like like you are talking about it with their parents and, you know, in places like this. Um, and the other one is uh, a lot of uh, companies have changed how they've uh, thought about climate change also because of their kids talking to the leaders in those companies, to the CEOs or to directors or engineers or whomever. Um, like your voice really matters, so uh, use it. I would love to just second that and um, have, I, I often use a, a Jane Goodall um, quote around, um, you know, this idea that like all together, this may feel really overwhelming, but recognizing that there's each and every one of us in our different places in the world, taking care of our piece of the puzzle, we can put that puzzle together as a community. It's not up to one of us to take on all of these pieces. It's up to you to look at where's your joy? What inspires you? What brings you to life? that's where you wanna put your energy and, uh, and build the relationships that are meaningful and, uh, and fill you up. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I, I always use this quote that my daughter uses. She's a bit of an environmental activist and she, she has this quote that it's only one straw said 7 million people. Every person contributes and by doing little steps to make things better, there's a compound effect too. So I think we need to be thinking about that. And one last thing I wanted to bring to everybody's attention was look at these people we have on this webinar. We have engineers, we have chemists, we have educators, we have um, biologists. So think about think about your future think about what career you might want to go into that um, you don't have to just go and study environmental science you can do good things for the environment by going into many different fields and um, I thank you guys for being here today as panelists because I think that helps us to see what how many different people from how many different professions are are working on a common goal and that is to to try and combat climate change. Jacqueline, do you have any final thoughts? No, other than just to thank so much our panelists for joining us today and all of you amazing participants and go out there and be climate game changers. Yes. Thanks thank everybody. Have a great day and a great summer and we'll see you in the fall for our final two webinars. See you in the fall.